Good morning and happy Wednesday. You gotta love that intro. Thank you, Rob Mara. Obviously, <laughs> Rob is on vacation. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the show yesterday. Uh, we'll be doing kind of the same thing today with two diff two very different topics. The first hour, we will uh, have a, a conversation on certificate of need in the healthcare industry. In the second hour, we will have a conversation on race in West Virginia and in America. I want to welcome in our co-hosts today, Mr. Stubblefield. Past Commissioner and retired Admiral, welcome. Thank you very much, Mike. Good to be here. And the the, the guru of hospice, I like to call her, Miss Maria Lonson. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. You. And joining us is Delegate Mike Height, um, good friend and, uh, and partner. How are you, sir? Good. Good morning. And on the phone is somebody that knows a lot about healthcare. She's a super nurse. I don't know how many different qualifications she has, but a good friend. Uh, she is the vice chair of health in the House of Delegates and also sits on education with me. Please welcome Ms. Heather Tully. Good morning, Eastern Panhandle. I am elated to be with you, and thank you for such a kind welcome, uh, my dear friend. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Heather. So obviously for this hour, what we want to do, folks, is we want to talk about certificate need in the healthcare industry, last week we really touched on trash and, and that, you know, the, the, the utility side. So I've asked each of you to kind of bring topics to the table. I am not as knowledgeable as all of you in the healthcare industry is, as, as what I would. I'm, I'm a guy, so I don't really go to, go to the doctor that much or deal with it. That's the, the wife's department with the kids. Um, so we're so gonna, you need it, Mike. <laughs> so I probably need it the most. But um, to me, it, it seems like, and I'll, I'll lead off, if you will, and then we'll kind of go from there. It seems to me like it, it, it's more insurance issues than it is health care issues. But um, what do you, what are the thoughts on why we need certificate of need in the healthcare industry um, across West Virginia. Obviously, Eastern Panama looks a lot different to where, where you live, Heather. And we'll, we'll start with you. So I live in central West Virginia in beautiful Summersville, West Virginia. And so very centrally located in the state. But I grew up actually in the Canal Valley. I have worked in the healthcare industry for, I've been a registered nurse in the state for over 20 years. I'm a dual board certified nurse practitioner now. I actually worked in a level one trauma center for a number of years in an ICU before I actually became a nurse practitioner. So I've got a lot of knowledge on this topic. And I personally do not think we need uh, certificate of need laws in the state. They're really kind of, they started out, certificate of need laws started out in the 1970s as a federal regulatory mechanism to control cost of health care and also uh, quality of health care. But research has since shown that neither of those, uh, those goals were achieved by place, placing certificate of needs laws in place. And a lot of states that had them in the 70s and 80s have subsequently repealed them. I do not feel that we need them. I really feel that, quite honestly, it hampers, um, it prevents competition, which hampers uh, development of high-quality health care services from other providers that are not within the state. And it also does not help to reduce costs because... You have a captive audience and you are beholden to pay the cost of whatever the existing health care facility charges you. So I feel like we should do a, a lot more repeal than what we've done. And the legislature has repealed a number of different uh, sectors, if you will, over the last few years, correct? We have done selective so repeal. So uh, our centers were one of the things that we repealed back the legislation on this past session. We have worked on also for acute care hospitals uh, to allow them to expand within their own footprint within so many feet of their campus. So those are two things that we have made progress on. Um, but I really feel like a lot of the other services as far as medical imaging services, which are in high demand, need to be looked at. Um, I know that there's always a rub with hospice care services, but really, you know, certificate of need laws to say that it's gonna protect your business is great unless that provider is lackluster. And so if you have a lackluster provider in your area, you do not want better quality services for your residents and your constituents. And I think the answer to that is yes. And I think uh, let's just touch on the birthing center uh, law that we just passed. Uh, that was very confusing to me uh, from somebody looking outside of the healthcare industry in. Uh, Dr. Joe Ellington had a, a very good speech on, on the floor where he, he actually voted for the bill, but he convinced me to vote against the bill while he 
while we were discussing it. So I, w I was in the minority where, where I did vote against the birthing centers because he did say it would really affect the more metropolitan areas and th those birthing centers would are not in the country for a reason. They would, they would go in right next to your, your big hospitals. What's your thoughts on that, Heather? I think it, it may have been, we, to be perfectly honest, we don't have a whole lot of metropolitan areas in West Virginia, Charleston, Huntington, you know, and your area in Berkeley Springs, Morgantown, are really about in Wheeling, are probably really the most metropolitan areas. For me, for my my patients or some of our patients here in the central part of the state, it's an hour to an hour and a half ride to an obstetrical office. So that means that those patients, a lot of times that do not have a lot of resources to have transportation, are missing those OB visits. So not only are are they having to access services for delivery, there's a lot of doctor's appointments that occur while a woman is pregnant, as we well know. They're missing those OB visits, and so they're not getting the proper prenatal care. So there's a hindrance to have a certificate of need for those birth centers when you may have a group of obstetricians or even a group of midwives that want to run a birth center with, you know, three or four beds for deliveries and provide that prenatal care within your community. So the, the, the pushback on that would be, do they have the same requirements um, of, a, of insurance, and, and do they have the same costs? And I think you addressed that in, in the bill, correct? We did. We had, that had certainly come up for discussion. Um, a lot of times to be able to even obtain insurance certificates for, you know, construction and all those sorts of things, you obviously have the same type of, you have a huge investment. And then also um, to be able to provide those types of services, you would have to have the same, even if it springs up, say, like maybe even a hospital and a, say one hospital has the market, say you have two hospitals in your area, one hospital has a certificate of need for birthing services, that means the other hospital can't even open up birthing services without going through a very extensive certificate of need application process before we did the repeal. So you would have twenty five, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, upwards of $100,000 invested even into the application process. So even the hospital that had the same level of services or could provide the same level of services was cut out of the game. Heather, this is Mike Height. Um, I, how do you, I'm going to pay devil's advocate here, and I'm not for okay. CON. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a free market guy, so I've been uh, in favor of repealing CON for a long time. But how do, you, how do you respond to those who say that there are certain services that are not profitable and that if a hospital um, offers those services, they need to have CON to protect um, somebody coming in and, and cherry picking all the profitable uh, pieces of health care and then they wouldn't be able to offer the non-profitable service any longer because they don't have the, the profitable services to offset that. I think that is a, a, an argument that is often made by hospitals that want to keep the certificate of need or agencies that want to keep the certificate of need. But research has demonstrated that the cherry picking argument is not valid. They have looked at places, in fact, that have repealed certificate of need or do not have certificate of need and found a greater abundance of those health care services that everybody is worried about cherry picking in those areas that do not have certificate of need. So I think that really is probably a moot point. And quite honestly, you figure out as a business person, what you do is you figure out how to make those services profitable. Is there an issue with efficiency and delivery? Is there a method of delivery of health care services that need to be changed? If it's medical imaging, do you need to change the process of how you schedule your appointments or those types of things? I think there's all kinds of innovative ways that we can solve that problem. And I'll, it I'll, is a concern. Heather, we have a unique issue up here in the East of Maine. We, we have competition from different states, north and south and, and, and east of us, for, for that matter. How do you stop um, providers from out of state coming in and then shipping their services out of state? So you would bring them in for a, let's say, a runny nose or, or, or something like that in an urgent care, and then they ship the, the, the actual doctor's appointment out of state because Medicare or Medicaid pays so much more in the, in the surrounding states. I don't know that that's, if, if that, that patient is insured on West Virginia Medicaid, I'm not sure how that, how that actually works to be able to get them to pay more. Quite honestly, I really think maybe with the PEIA things and some of the Medicaid things, I'm not sure that if it's a service that's offered in state that they're going to be able to get that out of state. I don't think that that argument has any validity either. Okay. Um, what you may see is there might be services like cardiac services that that may happen with. So say cardiac cath, runny noses and things like that. If you're shipping that out of state to have someone take care of that, 
then there's a major problem within your health care system, <laughs> delivery system anyway. Gotcha. Maria? Um, so, Heather, this is Maria Lawrence, and uh, my day job is um, the development director for our local hospice here, Hospice of the Panhandle. And we, mm-hmm. have, we have argued, um, as you're, I'm sure, aware, the hospice industry in West Virginia um, has done really a very good job at providing the services um, to residents of West Virginia. And we have argued that um, that certificate of need for hospice should be preserved um, for a number of reasons. Mainly, it's first off, it's a managed care kind of system. We get uh, X number of dollars per patient per day regardless. And Mike brought up the whole cherry picking issue um, in in the hospice world. We have seen an absolute proliferation, especially in states that do not have certificate of need, of for-profit hospices. And what we've seen in those instances, the for-profits will come in and really, I hate to use the word cherry pick, but it's kind of cherry picking. Um, they'll go and offer services robustly in area nursing homes, assisted livings. But when it comes to the cancer patient who needs tons of care, um, you know, just some disease processes that are just very expensive and, um, you know, the nonprofit hospices take everyone and our our idea what we have observed for the the for-profit hospices is that they don't necessarily operate the same way so if you could speak to that a little bit what your feelings are for that i'll gladly speak to the the for-profit and non-profit uh, i'm going to speak to that first i think that quite honestly there's a misnomer with a for-profit versus non-profit, there's a, non, there's a misnomer that non-profit organizations do not make money or do not exist to make money, and I think that that's preposterous. Um, a lot of people don't understand that because they think it's all charity care. Well, it is not because I would urge people to pull the IRS 990s for a lot of services that, or even hospitals or hospices that you think are uh, non-profit and look at actually the margins and look at the financial numbers. So I, I do encourage the populace to be educated on you know, non, not, prof, not for profit doesn't necessarily mean not making a profit. So with those models, you know, maybe it's a possibility that we do a different type of, maybe we don't give you a certificate of need for everything and maybe start assigning like a certain number of patients to each different agency. There's ways to do it without granting a blanket of certificate of need to make it more fair to allow those other agencies to come in and do pro, to provide services. And the other part of that is, is, quite honestly, how are they marketing their services if they're doing a lot of services? And, and that is a benefit of hospice because they can come into nursing homes. And a lot of, a lot of hospices didn't used to do that that much, but they, you see it more now. But are, are they better, market, better at marketing their services? And so that's another thing. You look at the marketing tools and what is your agency doing to market your services to those clients? Because you could pick up those clients just as well as that, that for-profit agency could choose to operate and pick up those assisted living or um, nursing homes. Well, and I would I would argue on that end that, um, yeah, the marketing is a great big piece, but then you pay money to, to do that, of course. And um, the, again, the, the for-profit model just looks at things a little bit differently. In West Virginia, um, 93% of hospice patients are covered by Medicare and Medicaid. And so you know that the centers um, pay a fixed daily rate. So again, if you're looking at the competition piece and how is that going to change when you open the door um, wide, then, um, you know, there's just sort of a question on if everybody's going to get paid the same way, then where do you quote unquote make money? Um, you know, I would certainly argue that our profit share at Hospice of the Panhandle is not exorbitant. Um, you know, we, we, we believe that we need to serve everyone at every stage and we also have found that the other services the ancillary services that medicare medicaid may not 
demand. For example, a proliferation of social work services and uh, grief support. We have a center for grief support that serves the entire community. You don't see a whole lot of for-profits saying, yeah, let's open uh, grief support for uh, for the school system, when, when there's a tragic death of a teacher or a child, whatever. I mean, we offer all those services. And again, I would say, even with the, the margins, but because of certificate of need, we can have a more robust program than others, um, others care, you know, to offer. So just and offering that. The- the support services, and I'm, I'm going to stop you right there because I don't think hospice agencies are the only people to offer those types of services. I know my FQHC, my federally qualified health center that I work for here as a practitioner, certainly has opened uh, counseling services. We do have you know, psych, psychiatric services as well as counseling services, and we've certainly we've had student deaths, and we've had a, several here within the last and year. And they're all free, we, correct? They are. They indeed are. And so they also, they do offer, we do offer those services, and our... Um, providers have gone out and certainly done grief counseling so you know maybe it's a, a possibility that if they're you know not choosing the patients are choosing those other providers and they're not offering maybe it's a service that they don't feel like they need or want or they can get it in another manner and i'm not saying that's the case i'm just certainly saying it's a it's a possibility and i'm going to go back to talk about the nonprofits. we have a certain nonprofit hospital within the state and several years ago we had the ceo making over five million dollars Um, So, you know, I really would encourage anybody to go look at those 990s. Um, I would also encourage you, I don't know if you have inpatient hospice there uh, within one of your hospital units or not, um, as far as a palliative care wing. Our hospice here operates one of those, actually two of them in Charleston. um, They actually have a hospice house, and then they also have two wings within hospitals that they operate for palliative care beds. And so that is usually a little bit more of a different model of payment than, say, outpatient services. So I think people need to be aware of that, too, and look at the payment models that are set up with those different differentiations in the services as well. Sure. Do you and have those sorts of things within the Eastern Panhandle? So we actually launched a palliative services program two and a half years ago um, that is under the umbrella of um, of Hospice of the Panhandle, but it is a separate program, and we have a 14-bed inpatient facility. Again, not a lot of for-profit hospices run um, run hospice houses. I, I'm very familiar with the ones in Charleston, Huntington, um, and uh, yeah, so... Anyway. So we have Bethley Lewisburg. There are two right. down too closer to here, but I'm, I'm more familiar with public with the ones in Charleston because of the nature of my employment. Sure, and That's sure. That people do not understand that there's a different payment model for that type of service. And that really, when you talk about high demand for services, it's those types of places that actually really provide the high demand services. It's not so much, I don't think, in home a lot of times. Because usually that patient's care demands get too great for the caregivers to meet at home. And they sometimes will end up in those hospice houses. And I, I think that, you know, people have to be aware of that, too, and figure out what is the best model. But I also don't think that automatically a blanket of protectionism by allowing their certificate of need to proliferate should be the limitation of what makes those decisions for healthcare consumers. Okay. So, so looking at this from, you know, 5,000 miles up or 5,000 feet up, obviously we have Heather, we all we knew going in that you, you were definitely against certificate of need. But what has the legislature? What has been the obstacles in the legislature over the last few years? Where you know, what are the things that we have, we have addressed, and what are the things that probably will never get addressed? Because I don't, yeah, th- I don't think there's going to be a a complete ban of certificate of need in West Virginia. I just don't see that happening. You know, and the other part of that, so one of the one of the things that we hear people really clamoring for are the in-home services, and not necessarily through hospice, but just the in-home caregiving services. So your homemaker, your aid services, those types of things are all limited with certificate of need as well. And so one of the things that we have seen with that is a lot of the agencies that provide, and it's usually seen like a lot of times like your senior service agencies, they can't provide enough staff to meet the client demand. 
So do we open it up and allow other senior service providers to come into the areas because they're not meeting the demands for the people that need those senior service care? And so if you have a certificate of need that's protected that and you've got people that aren't being served, then you've got a problem. The other issue that I have with certificate of need is when you go through the application process, a lot of your data, when you make the application, it will be antiquated by two or three years, your numbers that they use to fill out the application and do the application because the process usually takes so long. So the data and the numbers lag at the, you know, the health care authority. And so the analysis of what the needs are when you apply may not be the same analysis as that you have when you're at the end of the application process and getting approved or not. So I think that's a problematic thing. I'd like to see more up-to-date numbers used in the application processes. If we continue an application process, I think we've got a lot of areas that we need to work on. Yeah, uh, good morning, Heather. Uh, Bill Stubblefield. Uh, I'm always intrigued and struck by the fact how we can twist a subject around from a various perspectives to make a to make our position sound strong, the other other side sound much weak. Uh, and I keep coming back to the fact that the main purpose of all these services is to benefit the populace as a whole. Uh, we had a, I thought, a very in-depth discussion last week about trash handling. The something as benign as trash handling, we we saw the complexities of what what was involved in picking up the trash. And one thing that became clear to me, without a certificate of need, only parts of our county had in the past been and today probably would be served without a certificate of need. Certificate of need is actually benefiting the county as a whole. Now, s some folks on the, that do not have a certificate of need are making a point that they are being excluded. I'm not going to get into that, that argument. It's just the fact that certificate of need concept provides services to the county as a whole. Uh, I look at the, and I'm not going to speak to the, med uh, the medical hospitals. I don't know anything about the hospitals. Uh, I do sit on the board of hospice, so I have seen the hospice problem uh, up close and personal. Uh, Maria mentioned the point that that we do provide palliative care, we provide uh, inpatient, also we go to the to the homes, not only in our county of Berkeley County, but we extend into more rural counties, Hampshire County, Morgan County, and provide full-scale services there. Uh, the amount of monies that we get from Medicare, Medicaid, does not reimburse us for our cost. We spend a considerable amount of time trying to raise money on the outside in order to provide these services. We're a nonprofit, and someone asked on the chat, how much does our director get paid? I can assure you the director does not get paid nearly as much as she or he would be in other professions. So we work very hard to economize. But the big point is that we do not bring enough money in from Medicare uh, to, uh, to cover all of our costs. We certainly cannot cover the services in these outlying counties that we provide now. And and I am going to use the word cherry pick because I think that's the most most effective way to describe it. A for-profit would come in and literally pull out those patients, the probably the cancer patients that are going to be there for longer periods of time, that they have a a steady revenue stream coming into the organization. Uh, they're going to pick pick those up. Uh, will their advertisement be any more effective than ours? We work very hard on getting the word out to the public. I don't know, but for every patient that we pull out of Medicare, if we're still trying to support. Uh, going into our nonprofit hospice. Uh, if we're still trying to support services in the outlying areas, we're going to have to find money somewhere. And, and the money is going to be with the, um, uh, with the outside fundraising that we work so hard on. So I think a certificate of need, at least in our case, I'm not going to speak in your case, uh, and, I, and I think this is one of our problems. We try to paint uh, one paintbrush to fill in all the gaps. But in our case here, we in Berkeley County probably would not suffer too much for our, our, uh, our patients. But 
in Morgan and Hampshire County, we would. But there, those services would be lost. Maria? Well, I was, I was just going to point out as well, I think you make a, a good point. One of the things that Margaret Cogswell, our outgoing CEO, has said is when you talk about um, removing certificate of need for hospice, if the, if the for-profit comes in, if, if the door's wide open, you, you're going to still duplicate a bunch of services administratively because you're going to still need an executive director. You're going to still need somebody in the finance office. You're going to still. So those things that, that you have in the nonprofit, you're going to have to duplicate. Now, you know, is it across the board? Probably not. But there is going to be some duplication of services there, too. So, Here, and here's not that it's really duplication of services, or it's really an operational model in which maybe those four profits are, are figuring out how to operate more efficiently on a different uh, on a different margin or a different bottom line. Maybe they're spending, spending their dollars differently. So I don't know that I think it's a duplication of services. It's just maybe services that are coming from another provider and not your agency. <laughs> So with that, we're going to take a short break, and then we'll come back and pres uh, resume this conversation, uh, maybe come, come at it from a couple of different angles. Um, Colin, let's take, uh, let's take a break, and we'll see you on the other side. I'm going to kick off this one and just go straight to the height because he has a different um, set of I issues with certificate of need. Well, and, there's, and there's a couple of things I'd like to address. One is, you know, Heather, I think when you're talking about repealing certificate of need, you're also saying we still need to regulate this this um, this segment um, as well. So how do you how do you repeal certificate of need and still put in the regulations to prevent um, those who are are providing that service from not providing all the services? Well, and, you know, it's not so much regulation of, like, making them provide all of the services, but if there's a certain level of services that maybe everybody can agree upon, that maybe you look at doing licensure, that's what we do with the birthing center. So they still have to go through a licensure process through OFLAC. Sure. And you look at the licensure process to make sure that, like, safety mechanisms are in place, that, you know, these types of services have to be provided. So there's a way to do that without having a very expensive certificate of need. Quite honestly, one of the things, there are lawyers that that specialize in doing nothing but certificate of need um, application processes. So you have a subset of lawyers that are making money on this process, you know, quite honestly, making a lot of money for a lot of law firms to be able for people to provide a, essentially a competitor's veto. We don't stop, you know, Wendy's from building next door to a McDonald's. And I know that sounds very simplified for health care because we want, when we're sick, we want the best health care. But the other part of that, you know, I want to talk about this too, when you start to look at morbidity and mortality, Mercatus Institute of George Mason University did an analytic study in 2016. And they looked at not, like quality metrics of 921 hospitals from 2011 to 2015. And they found that the healthcare quality measures were significantly lower in certificate of need states compared to states without certificate of need. And they also found that the mortality rate was 5.5% higher in um, certificate of need states. So do we want higher mortality in our health care because we're offering this protection of uh, certificate of need? I think that the answer should be no to that. Well, excuse me a second. Uh, that... that sort of a answer or question uh, just begs for more explanation. There has to be other considerations as well. Have you looked at it in total, what the various drivers are? You, I don't think you put everything at the foot of CON. Well, and I think that, that study was actually absolutely based on certificate of need and looking at it, and I can certainly send you the, the research and the data on that. Like I said, it is a 2016 study from Mercatus at uh, George Mason University. Well, so yeah, I'm that, more than happy. I, I do have a link, and I'll be happy to share that. Well, and I don't doubt that's right, but if they're only looking at one variable, that one variable in CON, that does not present a very complete picture. That is a very well, biased study. One I don't, it wasn't looking at one variable of CON. It was looking at 921 hospitals, and I think that there were over. Let me pull the study up. But, but you said they were looking at CON. That's the only thing they, they were are. Looking at. They are. That is one one thing. But they were. They had also looked at, um, I believe, nine quality indicators for 921 hospitals in CON states versus non-CON states. Economic as well. Yes. 
Okay. How many uh, how many states have CON and how many? 35. 35. 35. 35. Okay. Uh, and if and you look at the map, states it's... regulate a different number of services with CON. So it's not whether you have it or have do not have it. It's actually how many services do you regulate under it. And West Virginia regulates more services than almost any other state across the nation. And and here's the here's the one of the other problems I have with CON, and you can look at Hospice of the Panhandle, mm-hmm. which I think is an exceptional organization and provide exceptional care. Um, but that is not always the case. You you can look at at, at other areas, and and you can say maybe their hospice service isn't very good and CON is protecting them or even a hospital or or someplace like that where CON is required and maybe they aren't very good and they aren't providing a a quality service and what is happening is CON protects them and protects another organization from coming in and and offering a better service and and eliminating them so but but on my side Mike you're, make, you're making the point that I alluded to a while ago. We're trying to do, and this is a problem with this state, everything has been determined from Charleston. That should be looked at from the local level as opposed to the statewide level. Well, they yeah, but how do you do that with county CON? By county analysis. They do that by county, county by county analysis, need analysis on uh, at the West Virginia Health Care Authority for figuring out whether or not you get a certificate of need. That's done on a county by county basis. Um, looking at your demographics and things, so I would encourage you to look at what, how they calculate that. So it's not necessarily determined straight from Charleston. I guess the healthcare authority is in Charleston, but they look at specific needs based upon you know certain areas. But there again, I like I alluded to the data lag sometimes one year, two years, three right. years from the time you start that application to the time your application is approved or denied. So, so that's on the flip thing. side. W- doesn't certificate of need protect certain rural areas, especially those smaller hospitals or smaller health care? Like the middle of West Virginia, I'm thinking, you know, it's, we've, we've got more health care here in the Eastern Panel than we than we do. We, do we, we got options, right? You can go north. You can go south. You, you've got plenty of places to cherry pick um, of where you get your health care. But I don't think rural West Virginia has a lot of choices. And that's why we said Hampshire and Morgan County while we go out of our local hospice. But there again, it's by the same by the same token. And I am Central West Virginia, so yeah. we are we're, you know, we have a little bit bigger of a little city here in Somersville than a lot of the other places in rural West Virginia, but we are still central West Virginia and very rural and like I explained, you know, we have about an hour to an hour and a half ride to, you know, some of the larger major medical centers, we do have a critical access WVU hospital here, which I am very proud to have in my community. They do an excellent job. We actually had a uh, city-run hospital before WVU took it over, and actually the community, the city-run hospital, was struggling. So the community came up with a million dollars. We had a businessman that donated a million dollars of his own cash, and uh, WVU put up a million dollars to be able to obtain our hospital. So I'm grateful to have them in the community. I think that was a, a prime example of how communities work together to preserve health care, the fabric of health care in the state. But that wasn't achieved through a certificate of need. That was achieved through a community seeing that we needed health care and we figured out how to do something about that. So one one point that Mike made, that Mike Height made about um, how do you how do you know if this hospice is good, this hospice is not good, and you're familiar with what the work that we do here in the Eastern Panhandle. Um, And Heather, I'm sure you're aware that, um, and again, we're about three years behind in collecting the data, but in 2020, um, CMS um, ranked, you know, West Virginia's national ranking for quality patient care and family satisfaction all the hospices in West Virginia number six in the nation Um, and uh, you know you might say oh well you know there are five above you or whatever but we we rank at the bottom of a lot of lists. not all the time that West Virginia gets in the top ten. No and and you know that's CMS that's the Center for Medicare and Medicaid that this is based on patient service family members, sorry, not patient surveys, but family satisfaction uh, surveys that that are sent to every single blessed 
hospice family after they've received care, and we came out number six in the nation. But, but that's hospice, and, and you're absolutely yes, right. Yes, I, yes. I, I started with, you know, hospice the panhandle is exceptional, no doubt about that. But there are instances, let's take it out of the hospice realm, let's take it into other realms uh, of, of medical services or providers um, that require CON, and that may not be the case. There may be providers out there that are not very good, and if they don't have competition, then those communities end up with, with a service that just remains not that good. So let's talk then about health care services here in the Eastern Panhandle. And Heather, you know that we have um, basically two big guys, if you will. We, um, and, and one feels very strongly one way about certificate of need and the other feels uh, very differently. So there's WVU Medicine and you made reference to WVU Medicine and I believe that they um, would like to preserve the cert certificate of need, Heather, if well, I'm, I'm not... I'm right there because actually they lobbied the last, last session for oh, uh, the, okay. uh, the birthing centers, and then they also did want to be able to expand within the acute care footprint. They would okay. probably lobby against allowing outside providers, but, you know, that's, that's another different type of argument. So I think, quite honestly, they try to do what's best for them. I was, and I understand that you do have Valley Hills as well, and I do think a lot of the leadership of Valley... Um, so I would think that, you know, quite honestly, they've wanted to offer a lot of services in your area. And I would want to see that expand because if you can offer an imaging center that is an outpatient imaging center that saves the patient money and time and they do not have to access the hospital, I think that's okay, too. Okay. WB yeah, will probably disagree with me. They're certainly welcome to. But, you know, there's a lot of things that we agree on and there's some things we don't. I just mentioned them because they are in my community. Gotcha. Heather, gotcha. Is, is imaging one of those uh, procedures that is very profitable for a it can be it, is, you know sometimes like if you do have an outpatient center and you figure out how to schedule patients then you can turn them over and you know you operate with certain confined hours it can be more profitable than some of the others typically um ambulatory surgery is usually one of the ones that you know people that make the cherry picking argument um will argue about but sometimes that isn't always the case that um there's a lot of places that have made the argument about the ambulatory surgery research there again shows that not necessarily that necessarily that isn't a valid argument because there are more surgery centers in areas or more more service providers and rural hospitals providing the same types of services in areas that that argument's been made so you know that those are usually two of the ones that get argued about i would argue about these poor people that live really farther in the southern part of the state that need a lot of in-home care services that they cannot get because the senior centers, you know, can control that through a certificate of need, and they just cannot provide the staff to meet the needs of those individuals. So you'll have people in waiting lists so, for months. So how, if, if they the can't provide services. the staff, how would bringing another private, whatever maybe, organization, then how maybe, would they find the staff? Maybe there's a different compensation scheme. Okay. Maybe there's something about the administration of the existing uh, senior service provider. Um, realm that doesn't appeal to people that they don't want to work for them. Maybe there is a different scheduling technique that they do with their in-home providers or there, there's better flexibility to meet around family or children's schedules. So there's a lot of ways to try to meet those needs without saying, no, you can't come here because of we have this blanket protection in place. So I want to I switch gears just a little bit, Heather, and I want to go around the table here and talk. You know, obviously, health care costs have skyrocketed over the last 10 years. Um, whether it's, you know, we just addressed PEIA and everybody got a rate increase, but the private industry, we've had rate increases every year since the Affordable Care Act. Why is it that the insurance companies and the hospitals, or the health providers, not hospitals, health providers, why are the costs so far up and why are insurance rates so far up? We'll start with Maria, what do you think? Um, uh, you know, it's, we got about ten minutes. Yeah, it's, <laughs> no, <laughs> I want ten minutes. I, I would, I would argue, um, you know, just uh, like you alluded to, just across the board, but specifically, um, nurses, the nursing industry. I think, you know, Heather, you can speak to that. Um, the, you know, the demand for nurses and the whole influx of the travel nurse 
syndrome, if you will, um, is just really changing the way we um, the way we do business. Um, and you know, everything else the the everything else rises when you um, have that very important sector of your business model um, that's in such high demand. It just so. seems like it's the only industry where you can't walk in and go, okay. I'll take a broken leg for four hundred and fifty dollars, or you know, it, it's not like it seems like a broken leg costs different amounts in every single <laughs> case. Well, and, and it you depends made, what your insurance is. The more money you make, the more you pay. Yeah, and and you made reference to the whole imaging thing, and Heather, you you talked a little bit about that. I mean, I had a provider who said to me, "If you need to get this MRI here, it's going to cost." 25 to 30 percent more or i can send you to i'm sorry hagerstown and here's what the you'll pay here's 450 what the fee. yes and yeah and it's a flat fee you know what you're getting right, yeah right exactly right. exactly Bill? yeah i think you're asking a question that's very difficult to answer to uh from the medical side there's training and technology that's probably unique to the medical field that no other field has uh we tend to forget that when we walk in the hospital that these folks have many 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 years of training and the technology is continually has to be upgraded uh you couple that with as uh, maria alluded to uh the staffing shortage the demand on staff uh I don't know the answer to that, uh, Mike. I wish I did. I'm like everybody else. I hear snippets of one argument, and I hear a counter snippet. Uh, has there been an exhaustive study on why it is so costly at one hospital and another hospital? It probably has been, mm -hmm. but I have no idea. And I'm not going to speculate of why it is, because I don't know the answer. We'll go to Mike. And it's, hey. curious. Well, it's curious, because... If you're talking about West Virginia to Maryland or West Virginia to Virginia, and both of those states have a certificate of need as well. So why are those services so much cheaper in Maryland um, than they are here in West Virginia when they, they have certificate of need as well? So it, it's, it's just odd because I've heard many times, uh, I'll just talk about MRIs. MRIs are very expensive here oh. in, in, in the panhandle. Uh, and the only place you can get one right now is, is at WVU uh, Health. And it, it, you can go across the, the river and get one for half of what it would cost here in Berkeley County. And yet is that, across the river also has a certificate of need. Is that because most of our patients are getting free health care in West Virginia? Is that why our costs are, are that much higher? I'm going to turn it over to you, Heather. So we have a very different um, payer mix here in West Virginia. And about 20% is private pay or insurance pay. And everything else is Medicare, Medicaid, um, or PEIA. So you have a different payer mix. And when you start to look at the way that Medicare, like, you know, their compensation or reimbursement models go, especially from on the Medicare side, like for Medicare reimbursement, a lot of the things that factor into your uh, reimbursement rates that they calculate, there are diagnosis-related groups, and then there, there are also geographical factors that they calculate in. So we have a aging population here in West Virginia, we have a very unhealthy population here in West Virginia. So that probably affects some of the reimbursement rates about the way that certain places are um, re like reimbursed. Probably the reimbursement in the Eastern Panhandle because it's a more metropolitan area, they get a better reimbursement rate than some of the providers here in Central West Virginia. You have to look at the way that the, the breakdown is of the geography. As far as the nursing shortage or nursing staffing, I really feel a lot of that um, is uh, become incumbent upon a lot of the healthcare providers in the state because a lot of nurses, there are places that nurses here in the state do not want to work for certain healthcare providers or uh, healthcare organizations. And because, number one, has it been because the pay has been stagnant? Has it been because maybe the contributions to their 401ks have been frozen? Has it been because they didn't get a merit raise and the merit raises have been frozen for two, three, four years? And then you've also got a CEO making over $5 million. I think those things need to be examined. I think when you look at how, uh, who you put on your hospital boards to make those business decisions are also very important. Figure out how, you know, people on your boards to your hospitals are appointed. And I think that really, quite honestly, those board members are incumbent to hold. Really, I don't worry about nurse compensation because they're actually there providing a service, but I do worry about CEO compensation. So really, should those CEOs be reimbursed at the rates that they are? Heather, you I think said, we have to look at all of those sorts of things. Heather, you said 20% of West Virginia is on... Is, is that, did I hear no, you right? No, 20, 
twenty percent is private pay, or and the rest is, is either insured. PIA or eighty percent. That's roughly eighty percent is on Medicare, Medicaid, or PIA. So that's pretty staggering when you when you when you when you say, say it like that. You know, we got fifty percent of our workforce who aren't participating. 20, only twenty percent of our health care is being paid by private um, insurance. Uh, it's mm -hmm. there's that's that's a huge reason why our health care costs are so much higher in West Virginia in my mind. I just looking from the outside. Right. And and that is the payer mix does factor into it as well. Absolutely. All right, we got about five minutes left. Heather, give us a um Give us a question for the panel. Or give us a, a, a wrap up, if you will. We've we've got a couple of minutes before the end of this, the the bottom, the top of the hour. Excuse me. Well, I have this is one of the topics that I'm very very passionate about. So I hope nobody mistakes my passion for being aggressive, but I am very very passionate about some of those changes. I think that can be brought forth positive changes in healthcare delivery by repeal of certificate of need. So I thank you very much for your time. I really look forward to working on some other uh, repeals. I think one of the things we're going to have to work on, maybe it's not hospice this time, but maybe it is working for the in-home services because I really see that that is a major issue. Um, because you have clients that are not being serviced in these more rural areas, and those clients are very dependent upon those in-home in -home, in -home, homemaking services to really maintain a uh, – way of life and actually to keep them out of nursing homes, which is very costly here. So we're going to work toward that. And that's one of the repeals I would like to see come forth with the legislative session upcoming. So I look forward to talking to you and I do thank you for your time. Yeah, I think Heather, you're making a very good point. And this comes back to the point I was making earlier. The, uh, the, the truth of it is a service has been provided to as many residents as possible. And I think you and I view a little bit differently the best way to provide the services. Uh, but I, I do think that has to be remembered at all costs, providing services to as many people as we possibly can. Maria? I, I look forward to working on solutions. Yeah, and, and again, um, differences of, of opinion are good. And um, and we certainly appreciate you coming on board and um, and and sharing yours, Heather, this past hour. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. And I look forward to further conversations. You all have a wonderful rest of your week. And please come down to visit us in Somersville. Thanks. Thanks, Heather. Appreciate your time. We'd love to have it. Thank you. Bye bye. And on, on a positive note, uh, I've noticed here in the comments, Anish Sampali, which is, I believe, with Valley, uh, Valley Health, he is. Valley mm -hmm. Health um, states that they'll be expanding imaging services here in Berkeley County in the next year, and that'll help drive down the cost uh, within the state. And I wonder if... And again, I, I'm just an outsider looking in on this. I wonder if it's, that's how... I think they bought into the Center for Orthopedic... Excellent. Oh, I think yes. I took they over had. that that building, which already had imaging. the imaging. I don't know what level they had because well, I don't know any of this stuff. But I wonder if that's how they got around. You know, but but well, I think we had different. a bill this past session that allowed it. If you imaging uh, something that had to do with imaging on campus within within a few, certain two hundred yards or two hundred fifty yards or something. Of the it sounds That's, like the it, church rule yeah, and well, alcohol. It, was, it, and it stuff. was the what what that was. I think was the WVU was expanding down in Charleston, okay. and, and they made it. They, they wanted to take over another yeah, hospital. It's, it's interesting. WVU changed their stance that they I, were and they I were, had I had. Absolutely yeah, against yeah, it was, yeah, repealing for a long CON time. until mm -hmm. they wanted to infiltrate somebody else's area, and then they well, wanted re CON repealed so that they could get into I wouldn't say area. infiltrate. I would say take over, <laughs> enhance, okay, well. because, uh, you know, on, and here's the reality of the situation. WVU probably will have 80 to 90 percent of the health care hospitals in West Virginia at some point. They're, they're the only ones that are expanding and in, in doing things within West Virginia compared to the other uh, the providers in down, down and South. Valley Health in, in certain areas. Of well, this. Valley Health is just for us. They're, they're right. not really down well, in. I think they're trying to get over into Hampshire and the areas like that as well. Yeah, and I had made out, mention of that to Anisha at some point, and he yeah. says the panhandle for the is most there. part and um, War Memorial Hospital is actually a Valley Health yes. entity um, as well. So. Well, I want to thank everybody for the conversation um it was very very good and i look forward to uh bringing this up we're at nine o'clock we're gonna take a break and we will be back in about six minutes